Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of TED Excellence, the show in which we discover the true secrets of mathematics, and thus the secrets of the universe. And I come to you live from my Corona Bunker on the moon with Dog Cat Fox, a Pepper Jack, and all of you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Thursday, tumultuous Thursday. Yes, we return once again to the wonderful world of education and design and uh, stuff. I don't know. So what was I thinking? <laughs> um, if you have been following my channel the last week or so, you will know that I did a episode of Curriculum of Fear this past Sunday in which I examined uh, a new curriculum, let's say, a new program, a new module that's going around about uh, equitable mathematics and the teaching thereof. Uh, I had heard things like this before, that making students show their work is somehow racist or prejudiced or something. Uh, I hadn't seen it laid out in, an, in a detailed plan like we've seen now since uh, last Sunday's stream. Uh, and I was curious. I was curious because one of the reasons, and little known fact, one of the reasons that I uh, have zeroed in on TEDx as much as I have, both since my channel started and certainly over the last couple of years, I honestly believe, and I have seen this happen, that a lot of things that are fringe beliefs or fringe, uh, uh, I don't know, philosophies or you know programs or initiatives uh, can and often do show up on a TEDx before they become mainstream. Or if nothing else, hint as to where perhaps some industries uh, are going uh, or some vocations in the case of uh, teaching and education. Uh, and so consequently, I was curious to sort of reverse engineer this. I was wondering if there was any TEDx's out there that dealt with interesting theories on mathematics. Was there any kind of precursor to what we uh, looked at on Sunday? So I found this talk. Um, I only know it by its title, effectively, uh, and that it was posted in 2016, that far gone yesteryear of 2016. Uh, so I don't know if it has anything to do, even tangentially, with the uh, mathematics program we were looking at, and I will continue to look at in upcoming streams of uh, Curriculum of Fear. Uh, but I thought it'd be interesting to find out. So... With all that as preamble, who's joining me today on this wonderful journey of discovery? That would be Matt Barnes. Hello, Mike R. Hello, Clown World. Didn't do nothing. Hello, Evil Clipazine. Hello, Check Your Logic. Hello, Grizzilla. Hello, Attack Alpaca. Hello, Debate Fly. Hello, Doctor Keeve. Hope to see you back once you're done with your dentistry, because uh, dentist sucks. But eh, necessary evil. Zach Osborne. Hello, uh, Luke Skywalker. Too. Hello, Sean Uli. Hello, Black Belt for Christ. Hello. Or, yes, uh, da, 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 da. Zeke Weiss, hello. The Redneck Ram, hello. John Miller, hello. Sun Nam Nyon Nation, hello. Robert Guber, hello. Uh, Mr. Tickle Trunk, hello. Deco Deco, hello. Megan Ring, hello. Jonathan Peterson, hello. Uh, Hearst Grave Gear, hello. Tux Mint, hello. This is Kyle, thank you so much. Hello, chat people and scribbles. Hello, Kyle. You've changed your avatar. I noticed. Uh, Legit Low Talker, hello. Johnny Stoffel, hello. X4390246, seven, hello. Puttuck, hello. Lexi Mads, hello. I guess we can begin. Okay, Zero the Hero, 909, hello. Humble Clay, hello. The Other Choice, hello. All right. So with all that as preamble, let us get into this. Today's bingo card is card A, A as in Archimedes. So get your bingo cards ready. Link to the bingo cards are in the description below. Uh, I will start off with a few seconds for a sound test. You guys tell me if you can hear it, and then we will begin with math. Oh boy. Good evening. Good evening. Shelley M. Jones, PhD, culturally relevant pedagogy in mathematics, a critical need. All right. You guys hear all that? You hear the hello, hello, hello. Sounds good. Sounds good. Audio good. All right. So let's see what Dr. Jones, Dr. Jones has to say. And thank you to Jesse Turner mm -hmm. and John Fauché hmm. for inviting me here tonight. Okay. And I thank you all for coming. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. Math is cultural. Uh, d- do tell how. It's not a question. It's- oh, it's not a question. Math is cultural. Okay, like I say, I'll be curious to know how. I've never, I've never really thought of it in those terms, so I'm, I'm, I'm ready to be educated. It just is. Okay. Let's do an experiment. Wait, it just, wait it's not a question. It just is. Okay, tell me. This is the scenario. Okay. I'm in Otavalo, uh-huh. Ecuador. Okay. And I don't speak Spanish. Okay. And the vendor doesn't speak English. Okay. But I want six oranges. Right. So I want everyone in the audience to show me six with your fingers. You're not going to tell me that how people throw up, you know, threes with their ladder two, ladder three fingers or with their middle three fingers that constitutes cultural math, right? Because I don't think six in Ecuador is a different number than in America, regardless of which fingers you throw up, you know? Because like in Germany, they'll throw up uh, their pinky, uh, their, uh, what do you want to call it? Their ring finger and their middle finger when they want to say three, right? Uh, that, that, that's a very European thing. Whereas in America, they'll throw up their middle three fingers. Okay, so so hand gestures equate to mathematics. Maybe I'm jumping the gun. Let's find out. Hold them up in the air. Let's see how you show six. Wow. Look around, see the variety. Uh-huh. So we have six this way. Yeah. And we have six this way. And you know what they all have in common? It's all the number six. And we even have six this way. Uh Uh-huh. In Zulu, you can put your hands down. In Zulu, six literally means take the thumb. Take the thumb. Six literally means... What? What? Uh, Redneck Ram, math is cultural, but it is a constant across all peoples that numbers are numbers. Six oranges there is six here too. Yeah, I mean, uh, if we're going to go that route, you can say, oh, well, do you know the way in which you dole out dollar bills? Like if you had to, if you had to uh, like peel off uh, bills, like money, uh, it's done differently in different cultures. Uh, It's just one of those things. It doesn't change the number, it doesn't change the math. It may change the presentation, but six is still six, Ecuador or the US, so. In Tanzania and Western, in Rwanda and Western Tanzania, you might even see six this way. And I- Uh Uh-oh, now, a lot of people have pointed out on the thumbnail, those gestures are white supremacist dog whistles. Although, as again, since this was uh, filmed on or around 2016, it's possible, possible that uh, uh, this happened before we found out the secret of the OK sign. So just want to give that disclaimer. I know some people had this and they wondered, yes, I saw you. A-OK. <laughs> Somebody was like, it was me, it was me in the audience. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Tickle Trunk. Math is cultural. It's Mesopotamian. Disappointed that so far we've learned nothing about Mesopotamia or the Middle East. Why are we in Africa? Um, I mean, the origins of mathematics. If she's, if she's going to be talking about the history of the origins of mathematics and so on, and the evolution thereof, great. Yes, different cultures started that rolling, but mathematics in and of itself as a concept, as an abstract, does not, is not dependent on a particular culture. It does not possess a culture. So I don't know where we're going, but we'll see. Johnny Stoffel, thanks so much. I tap thumb to pinky easy, one-handed six in ASL. Again, there are different methods and different ways of doing it, but, you know, doesn't change six from being anything other than six, whether it's in Tanzania or Ecuador. And thank you, John Miller. I'm seeing a regional theme here. Will she say that math is anti-black? I don't know. Let's find out. As it turns out, finger gestures are very cultural in nature. Very cultural in nature. Yes, I, yes, okay. Yeah, no. Throwing up two fingers in the U.S. is just the number two. Throwing up two fingers in 
say Britain is basically flipping somebody off. So yes. And if you think about it, counting is one of the most basic things, one of the most basic mathematics activities that a culture can do. Yes. Maybe. I don't know. Well, today, I'm going to talk about culturally relevant pedagogy in terms of mathematics, right? Right. Uh, so for those of you listening at home, there's a now card on the screen that says, Gloria Ladson Billings, I don't know who that is, says culturally relevant teaching is a pedagogy that empowers students with empowers being highlighted in red. Okay, do tell. So culturally relevant pedagogy, mm -hmm. uh, teaching is a pedagogy that empowers students. How? And empowers them intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically. Okay, uh, you had me, kind of, maybe, at least in concept, up until you got to politically. Uh, but okay, do tell. I really like that one. Uh, I, you really like that one? You like the politically part. You want to politicize math class. Okay. By using cultural reference to impart knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Uh-huh. First of all, yes. students come to school to learn. Ah, uh, well, maybe, kind of. Anyway, I, uh, I have neglected the bingo card. Let's go to the bingo card real quick. Uh, collectivize his own demographic? Mm, not yet. Systemic institutional? Not yet. Equity? No. Childhood or family anecdote? Not yet. Diversity and inclusion? Not specifically. Uh, plays victim? No. Microaggressions, uh, unconscious bias? Not yet. Privilege? No. Contradicts own point or argument? Don't know what the argument is yet. Patriarchy? No. Weightless example? Wage gap? No. Free space? Well, we'll get there. I'll, I'll circle free space just as a default. So I can feel like I did something. Uh, feminism, no. Marginalized marginalization, no. A list. Uh, that was a list. She listed off all the things that uh, culturally relevant pedagogies will do for students. So I'm circling a list. White supremacy, not yet. Word salad, not yet. self vilification and wretchedness, no. Make something about race, sex, et cetera, for no reason. Um, I'll be curious to see where we get into the politics of math. If she ever gets there, attempt to coin new buzzword, buzz phrase. No, I mean she's put together an interesting series of words, but I wouldn't call it a new buzz phrase necessarily yet. Uh, mind reading assumes motives, not yet. Benevolent condescension, no. Anecdote that probably never happened. We haven't had any yet. And leaves out vital context, not as of yet. We're only two minutes in, but you never know. All right, so so far I have free space and a list circled. Uh, hello, Angela Ariaga and Giovanni Prince. And Prosaic Dreams in Blue. And Mr. E. And if I missed anybody else, The Gay Rascal, hello. And The Best Remy, hello. All right, so tell me more. We know that. We know that. But we also know... Wait, wait, what do we, what do we know without question? Sorry. First of all... Yes. Students come to school to learn. Uh-huh. We know that. Right. But we also know as educators that what students learn in the classroom is not all there is uh yes there's there's book learning and then there's you know the real world so okay i i agree thank you Pinkal, the driving eight man you know it will be two plus two equals five i i don't know let's i'm i'm waiting with bated breath for where we're going with this johanna hayes uh -huh. Our teacher of the year. Okay. And she's from Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh huh. She really believes that it takes more than what you do in the classroom. Okay. And so I agree with that. And I think most educators know that. To do what? I mean, I guess there are field trips. If we're not just talking about classroom activity, what are you talking about? 
Gloria Latson Billing says, Yes. Culturally relevant teaching uh -huh. has three criteria. Okay. One is, yes. is that students have academic success. Culturally relevant teaching has three criteria. criteria. Students have academic success. Uh, isn't that the hopeful result of the teaching? It's a criteria. It's required that they first have academic success before you can start it. Um, maybe, maybe I'm confused. Thank you, P-Dog Knight. Five rocks plus five rocks equal eight rocks because Ray Ray always shorts me when I'm high. Is that where she's going with this? <laughs> I don't know. So far, we're starting out with the goal of academic success before we even get to the process of reaching it. So we're going backwards. I don't know. And uh, yeah, she did have a list just then, but I've already circled a list on the uh, uh, bingo card for her uh, recitation of the elements that will empower students. Okay, so the first criteria of culturally relevant pedagogy is academic success. So we have to already have academic success before we can get there. Okay. So it's not enough for the access. We need the attainment. What? Two, that students have cultural competence. Cultural competence. Okay. What is that defined as? But let's face it. We are also hearing that teachers need cultural competence as well. Define cultural competence. And finally, that children develop a critical consciousness. Uh, okay, so they need to already have academic success. They need to have cultural consciousness, whatever the heck that is. And they also have need critical consciousness. I, I'm, I'm hoping you're going to be defining your terms as we go forward, because I don't know what you mean. We have to help students. And this is where the politically comes in. Uh-oh. We're Okay, tell me. I am ready. My body is ready. Where, where does the politically come in to mathematics education? We have to help students understand and be empowered to challenge the status quo. What? In math class? I mean, unless you're going to encourage them to find a new way to do math. And, and truth be told, there are new things about mathematics being discovered all the time. But if we're talking about like elementary school, even through high school, what? Latson Billings goes on to say. This, this one lady, this one lady says things and therefore it's gospel. Is that it? Okay. That schools use sometimes, often, do not um, really support culturally different students because they don't provide a social context for learning. Okay, just for reference, the, the slide she has up reads thusly. Schools often do not meet the needs of culturally different, different students because they do not provide a social context for learning that allows the students to access knowledge in ways that are comfortable and familiar to them. Okay, uh, thank you, the gay rascal. Critical is never good. Yeah, critical is kind of one of those red flag words for where are we going with this? Okay, so if you have a student from uh, Ecuador, let's just say, since that was her big first example, in a school that's in America, um, if the kid holds up, I, I don't know, two sets of three fingers on each hand, we're not going to understand what that kid is saying. And likewise, if I hold up five fingers on one hand and one finger on the on the other, the student's not going to understand what I'm indicating. But, um, Where students can have access to the knowledge in a comfortable, in a familiar way, and we heard earlier, in a safe way. Okay, well, give me an active example. Give me an example of how that would work. What would be required of a school to 
transmogrify each classroom to accommodate one, two, or some small number of students that are culturally different regarding mathematics. How would that work? Why would you want to separate that child out from everyone else? Are you going to be able to take the extra time to reconfigure your entire style for each individual quote-unquote color that some child supposedly represents? The logistics of that are beyond me, but then I'm not a teacher, so I don't know. Thank you, Point Curation. Hope everyone is having a good stream. Well, I hope so, too. Thank you, Point. All right, so, yeah, every student needs to have a comfortable and safe way in which to access knowledge based on their culture. Okay? So the question is, uh -huh. can we teach mathematics in a way that students can connect to themselves and to their communities and to their identity? What? Okay, the first one, and I think I said something to this effect in the uh, Curriculum of Fear Street. Uh, you, can, you can relate mathematics to a student in some way, shape, or form that they can likewise relate to. So, you know, if you're talking to, I don't know, teenagers or something, it's like, if you have four apps on your phone and Apple decides to delete three of them, how many apps do you have left on your phone? You know, story problems, relating things to the real world, that kind of stuff. It, sure, but identity, community, what does that mean? I, I haven't circled leaves out vital context yet. I might do it as an aggregate at the end of this, but I need definitions. I, I need details. Throwing out terms and ideas without giving us examples or definitions helps nothing. And, you know, it's hard to learn something without examples. Uh, thank you again, Johnny Stoffel. Slide number six, pound EY, how Western math ignores shamanic power. <sighs> yeah, there's a, uh, there's a phrase that I come, I've come across several times in other videos, uh, not just about math or schooling necessarily, but uh, it's something to the effect of, indigenous ways of learning or indigenous ways of knowing or, or something like that, uh, wherein you have to entertain spiritualism of some sort or another or folklore or uh, ancient practices and put them on the same level as modern science and so on. And that's necessary or otherwise you're being, I don't know, dismissive or racist or something. Anyway, that's what that reminded me of. Uh, thank you, Pakala Driving Eight Man. And how does the number seven feel like? Yeah, what is what is seven's identity? I wonder. Can we teach in a way that empowers students to to challenge injustice? What? And most of all, can we teach in a way that honors students and their cultural and their intellectual greatness? What, what are, <laughs> okay, um, all right, so for those of you again listening at home, there's a slide on the, the board, I guess, um, I'm not quite sure what the picture has to do with anything, but uh, the little uh, captions read thusly, virtually every student can do something well, a quotation by Geneva Gay, 2000, page one of some book that is not named. And then we have bullet points. Can we teach mathematics in a way where students connect to themselves, their communities, and their identities? Uh, bullet point number two. Can we teach in a way that empowers them to challenge injustice and inequity? Uh, I will circle equity on the card now, because that is, I mean, it's a different word, but it's it's implying the opposite. And lastly, can we do this in a way that honors their cultural and intellectual greatness? I don't know what that means. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Tickle Trunk. Seven is full because seven, eight, nine. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, I don't know. Can we teach these ways or in these ways? I, possibly. What does teaching in those ways mean? 
There's a lot being said there. Yeah, there is. So let's think about this. Okay. If we want to empower students, mm -hmm. the task in our classroom yes. have to change. Okay. Right? Right. Chink. Right. Okay. What What are the tasks in the classroom that have to change to achieve teaching math for identity? So the current curriculum we have uh -huh. is just not going to do it. And the current curriculum we have is what? Oh, I want to tell you about my young lady there. So she um, participates in a Saturday STEM program. Okay, I, I think she's referring to the girl that was pictured in the previous slide again for those of you listening at home. So I think they're not showing it. So, all right. Uh, but we're coming up on an anecdote. So let us weigh whether or not this anecdote whatever it is, actually happened. And I worked with a group of students there mm -hmm. to create clocks for Benjamin Banneker Day. Clocks for Benjamin Banneker Day. That name does sound familiar. In that particular day, they were able to use mathematics equations to go around the hands of the clock and also just to show their artistic side. And she, of, of course, is very artistic. Uh huh. Uh, was each of those mathematic equations filtered through their various cultures first? Did you make sure to relay to them the mathematics equations using the correct hand gestures? So Geneva Gay says that every student has a strength. Oh, well, I, mean, I guess if Geneva Gay says it, then it must be true. Yeah, you know, oh, there, Pete, everyone is good at something. Wow, how insightful. I've never heard such a thing before. Golly gee whiz. Uh, thank you, the gay rascal scribe. I instantly thought of that TED Talk with the Boeing engineer when the jet engine dropped in a garden. What? I must have missed that TED Talk. Is that one I did? I don't remember that. Huh, I'll have to look that one up just for reference purposes, or if you can like uh, tweet me a link. What? Okay. Uh, yeah, all right, so your students made clocks, and every student is good at something. Everybody in the world individually is good at something. You know, it's relative to the next person who's good at it, but yeah, everybody has a talent or strength or something, sure. Uh, thank you again, this is Kyle. Do you know why six is afraid of seven? Because seven doesn't respect the culture of six and is pushing a white supremacist form of mathematics. Yeah, I can believe it. Every student does something well. Yes. And that's what we have to start with. Well, but we're talking about mathematics. We're not talking about anything. We're not talking about jack of all trades or something or trying to find where you fit in the world. I mean, presumably that's where students find their strengths by going through school and different subject matters and what are they interested in and on and on. I thought we were talking about math. So what if a student's strength isn't math? You know, what if they can do basic math, but they're not interested in it or they find it difficult and they're more, they have a better facility with words, let's say. I have no idea why I'd bring up that example. I, I don't know anything about that myself. Not liking math all that much, but being at least as far as I'm told, relatively good with words. So what do you do with that student? How do you handle the cultural consciousness and critical consciousness of a student who's not a big fan of math? So here's some real life stories. If we want to connect to students, these are some of the things that we could do. Okay. Examples. Great. Give me an example. These are researchers that do, uh, that do math for social justice. Oh, math for social justice. Okay, I, I'll be honest. When I picked this one out to do today, I was only about maybe 40% sure it would even be at all related to the equitable math pathway thing that we talked about on Sunday. I was obviously wrong. My estimate was far... Uh, under underballing it, let's say. Lowballing it, that's what I meant. Uh, thank you, the gay rascal, the TED talk about women and black matter. Oh, oh, that, wow, that's an old one. Oh, I remember that. That, oh, yeah, that's right. 
I forgot about that one. It's a long time ago. Gosh. Wow, that's a blast from the past. Thank you for that. Thank you, Johnny Stoffel. Why didn't eight respect seven? Because seven had six with five. <laughs> oh boy, the numbers stop the numbers. Okay, real life stories for social justice. And culturally relevant math. Uh-huh, yeah. Bill Tate worked with a teacher uh -huh. to do a project with students uh -huh. to sort of learn about their community. Okay. And what they wanted to do yes. was to count the number of liquor stores in their neighborhood, and they did that. They <laughs> okay. Uh, so we're not talking about culturally relevant math. We're talking about using the facade of a math project to push a socio-political narrative, right? Mathematics is the Trojan horse, let's say, for an entire ideology. We're not talking like there's a different kind of math between peoples. I mean, you started out saying that mathematics is different in different parts of the world, and I waited for you to prove that, but you haven't. So instead, we're going to go count how many liquor stores there are. Now we're going to go count how many gun stores there are. Now we're going to count how many uh, zip codes have a, I don't know, uh, a, a, a income bracket of block. Is, is, is that where we're going with this? Is that what culturally relevant math is? I'm thinking that might be. Took a walk around their community. Uh -huh. And then they took the bus to the suburban community. Uh -huh. And they counted the number of liquor stores or package stores, if we want to say it nicely. Package stores? That must be a, an East Coast thing. I don't know that one. In that neighborhood. Uh -huh. And they found out, to their surprise, that there were a lot more liquor stores in their neighborhood. Really? Was that surprising? Um, is it surprising that alcohol is a Okay, anyway, uh, thank you, Bacala Driving Eight Man. Did they also count the Hennessy? Uh, did they also count grocery stores? Did they also count, uh, you know, uh, gas stations as quick, quick marts? You know, places that sell alcohol all over the place that aren't literally liquor stores? Did they count the availability of alcohol? Or did they just count things that were explicitly liquor stores, I wonder? And so they wrote their city council. There's the politically again, right? Mm. So when I first started teaching, uh -huh. I, I didn't know about that word politically. I said, that's not my place. Wow. Uh, so before you started teaching, you understood that as a math teacher, you're not supposed to be, or ideally, you're not supposed to be pushing a political narrative or philosophy on your students, trying to politicize mathematics. And not even politicizing mathematics, just using the pretense of mathematics to push a political narrative, to create activists in your own school. So at one time, you were a rational adult, but now you've seen the light. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tickletrunk. We can sure count on them to ruin mathematics. It's not, well, I mean, this, is, this has nothing to do with math. We're not even talking about math, are we? No, we're not. But what I'm learning is that it is my place. Yeah, yeah. what you've been indoctrinated into is that it is your place to turn students into activists using mathematics as a delivery mechanism for a political ideology, or at least political activism. Okay. And so anyway, these students wrote a letter to their city council, uh -huh. and they asked to close 13 liquor stores. So they asked to put several small business owners out of business. Okay. That were in 1,000 feet of their school. <sighs> okay. Okay, now that, that qualification there, I'm thinking about that one for a second. Uh, that, that's not, ne okay. I, I will concede that isn't necessarily a condition I would have a problem with. How they know that? 
they did the research. Did they count how many steps or, or just look up on a map and take out a, a compass and draw a circle? And I think John Miller, did she ever say she was a math teacher? This is almost the equivalence of a math curriculum being made by a history teacher. She screams social studies. Um, I don't know what her role is. It just said Dr. Uh, Jones, PhD. I don't know what she has a PhD in. She seems to be referring to herself as associated with math teachers. So I don't know. Um, but she's talked, to, she's talked about her students and then mathematics. So I am guessing that math is at least one of the disciplines she teaches. That's, that's my best guess. I don't know if it's her full-time uh, focus, but at least. Uh, thank you, Piccolo. Just take the booze out of the stores. Why close? Well, if they're liquor stores, they don't have anything else that they're selling. So, uh, but I mean, if they, okay. If they put in a city ordinance or something that said that, you know, within this distance of a, a school or children or something that certain businesses uh, should not operate, depending on, you know, whether or not those types of things draw crime or threats or dangers and so on, I don't necessarily have a problem with that. It would depend on the circumstances and the, the specifics, of course. So in that regard, eh, I, I might be agreeable, but uh, that's beside the point of using children as a shield for pushing your own political and or social changes. I mean, why didn't the teachers do that? Nope. They're coming for me. Oh my God, they're coming for me. No, they're not. Okay. Anyway. So students are learning and they're dealing with issues from their community. No, 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 no. Students are being used as a front for teacher initiatives and politics. Why would that math teacher, or was it you? I don't know. Anyway, why would the math teacher specifically have the students count liquor stores, of all things, in their community? And I'm sure it was the students all by themselves that came up with the idea of sending a letter off to the city council. Don't do that. Don't pretend like you're just ushering your students to a logical conclusion. No, no, no. You used the students, or the teacher in this instance, used the students to further their own agenda and used math as the justification. Now, even if I may agree with the outcome or the initiative involved, that's beside the point. Okay, manipulating students to push your political or social agenda is not something you get a gold star for. And they're using math. They uh -huh. use percentages, no. decimals, no. and fractions oh. to make their case to the city council. Uh-huh, yeah, right. <sighs> wow. Wow. And they were successful somewhat, okay. not totally. They didn't close 13 liquor stores, but they were somewhat successful. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what, what's somewhat successful? Is that like being a little pregnant? Because it sure doesn't sound like it. What, what is somewhat successful? The other picture with the quilts. Okay, no, no, okay. Leaves out vital context. No, I'm sorry. Somewhat successful? No. No, 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 no. Circling leaves out vital context. Uh, da, 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 systemic institutional. Uh, she's talked about having the students pa uh, challenge the status quo, etc. So I'm going to circle systemic institutional. Um, weightless example. I, I'm 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 tempted to circle it for that liquor store thing because she started out well. Okay, it's it's one or the other. Because she started out telling us that in different cultures, math is expressed in different ways. Okay, that's your opening gambit, fine. But then you move on to, now we're going to use math to push the social agenda, social justice. That has nothing to do with the expression of mathematics. In fact, that has very little to do with culture, etc. You were... Yeah, I'm going to circle weightless example, because somewhere in there, one of these things is a weightless example. Uh, I can flip a coin, but either way, it's going to be the same thing. So, so far, what I have circled is systemic institutional equity, weightless example, free space, a list, and leaves out vital context. Um, 
And guys, if you have suggestions for squares to be circled, hold on to them. I'm probably going to miss them in the course of the chat and paying attention to the video. Wait until we get done with the video and uh, I will entertain anything we haven't already circled. So just don't want to frustrate anybody, but I'll get there eventually. Okay. So what about the quilt? Uh, Jacqueline Leonard and her colleagues uh -huh. worked with fourth grade teachers in Philadelphia. Okay. And they wanted to incorporate culturally relevant uh, teaching in their reading and in their math classroom. Fourth graders in Philadelphia. So we're talking what, like nine, 10 year olds? Okay. And so what they did was they made quilts. So the students were able to be artistic. They were able to tell the story because a quilt tells a story about your life. What does making a quilt have to do with, I mean, I guess measuring the, the fabric or something? Sounds more home ec, but okay, where's the math in there? So they were able to talk about themselves. And the teacher, in fact, learned a lot about the students that she didn't already know. And this has what to do with mathematics? The other thing is they learned area and perimeter. Okay. All right. Okay. So we're still doing the math. Yeah. All right. Yes. Math is involved. Okay. Right. Yeah. When Gloria Latson Billing said we have to have academic success, she didn't mean we were going to do culturally relevant math and dumb down the math. But what? How do you dumb down math? I mean, you either have a level of competency for understanding certain uh, uh, structures in math or you don't. But I mean, one plus one is always one plus one. You can't get much, quote unquote, dumber than that. And honestly, if you did find a way to dumb down the math and the student understood the math, then they've understood the math because the math is kind of a constant. If, if, okay, if dumbing down math leads to further uh, retention and competency in mathematics, you've already won. I mean, can you imagine if you found a way to dumb down calculus and still achieve the results of calculus? That'd be great. Wait. What do you mean? You, 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 you want to make the math more complicated? I, ah. We're still going to do math that is complex, that gets students thinking, and also that uh, sort of hit the standards, whatever those might be. What? I'm circling word salad. That just, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Because all teachers have to think about that. Uh -huh. The last picture shows corn rolls. And I had a colleague talk to me um, about a week ago. Corn rolls. Uh, well, here's the thing. Name anything. Name any tangible thing in the universe. All right. There's math involved, you know, whether you're actively doing it or not. If you're counting how many times you have to cross over, like in the, in the, in the case of cornrows, there's in order to create a pattern, right? A recognizable pattern, an even pattern, you have to cross over the hair in a very uniform way to achieve a uniform result. So there's counting, you know, there's aesthetics, there's pattern, there's math. If you're going to spend some time arguing to me that there's math involved in cornrows, you're pushing at an open door. There's math involved in your dress pattern. There's math involved in the stand that is holding up your notes. There's math involved in the air that you're breathing. Everything involves math. Now, I will credit any teacher who can take something like that, something that is in the real world, so to speak, 
and translate it to students as a way of understanding mathematical principles. Great, that's great. That's fine. Story problems, active examples in the world, fine. Is this really the advanced quote unquote pedagogy that we were promised at the top of this from a professional teacher? Because this sounds so basic. And she had a math lesson that she wanted to do that involved cornrows. Uh huh. And she has an African American female student in her classroom. Uh huh. Well, she didn't feel it was her place to just pick that particular student out. Uh huh. So she emailed the whole class and said, Do you know anyone that knows how to do cornrows? So she spread out the blame for targeting a particular student. Okay. And would they mind speaking to our class? Uh huh. Lo and behold, that student felt comfortable enough to lead that class discussion. <gasps> Will wonders never cease? So the teacher was, oh, I don't know, culturally conscious about what she assumed to know of that student's abilities, but didn't want to be called out on assuming someone's lived experience, so just sent out a general fishnet to see what they could come up with. Uh, why, why didn't the teacher take it upon themselves? I don't know what the teacher's gender was, so I'm being very careful here, uh, to teach cornrows. Do they not know how to do cornrows? Why did they pick cornrows? I mean, if the teacher themselves did not know how to do cornrows, why ask a student to do it? Okay. And this was a student who normally would sit in the back of the room and not be engaged. Um... Okay. And so the teacher told me that story because she, she was really happy about it. But also she tried something new. She did a math lesson about cornrows. And there's actually a book that's called Math is a Verb. And it has a full lesson on just cornrows. And Again, no argument that you can find practical applications and examples for patterns, numbers, and so on in relatively mundane things because, well, mathematics is everywhere. So, okay. And that would have been fine. The little part about, well, she wanted to ask this one student, this one African-American student, but uh, she didn't want to single her out, even though that's literally what she was doing and did so by the time she got the reply back. But anyway, uh, the, the, okay, make something about race, sex, etc. for no reason. Because, here's the thing, uh, there were, at least in my high school, okay, and this is, this is anecdotal, uh, there were white girls and Asian girls who did cornrows as well. I would see them doing it on the steps before class every day. Uh, so I, I, that, that has nothing to do with nothing or braiding hair or anything else. It's like, anyway, uh, thank you, Johnny Stoffel. Math targeted because it's the pure foundational science. Well, yeah, you, you can make math apply to everything and make it a part of everything because it is a part of everything. You know, you want to talk about universal constants. You want to talk about the original uh, indelible sin of the universe, it's going to be math. So yeah, you can tie math into everything and make it justify anything, I guess. Okay, so cornrows. And then hit the button. And there's, other, the, uh, of course, other uh, culturally relevant lessons in there as well. Such as? And, and what did the cornrows teach? I mean, okay, if you're going to bring up the example, what did the cornrows teach? At least you brought up perimeter and so on with the quilt. What mathematical standards or, pr or principles did cornrows teach? Really? So we're always trying to connect to our students. Yes. And so my colleagues and I yes. 
uh, created or uh, put forth a framework uh -huh. for culturally relevant, cognitively demanding math tasks. Okay, now this is where I'm wondering if this isn't the precursor to what we talked about on Sunday. Uh, if not, maybe a direct tie-in. I don't know, but uh, okay, what's your lesson plan? And what we did was we started with the uh, literature on culturally relevant teaching, and then we added in the literature on cognitively demanding tasks. So you did a mashup of educational principles. Okay, now on the off chance she does not recite the entire slide here, I will go over it briefly. The title is Culturally Relevant Cognitively Demanding Mathematics Task Framework, Matthew Jones and Parker, 2013. Uh, there's a book cover off to one side that says The Brilliance of Black Children in Mathematics Beyond the Numbers and Toward New Discourse. And what does the skin color determine about mathematical ability? I don't know. Uh, underneath that is a blurb, I guess, counters the quote-unquote deficit thinking regarding black children and their achievement in mathematics. So math teachers are all racist. Okay. Uh, next, and now this this feeds into the equitable math practices or, or teaching that we talked about on Sunday because the the bedrock of that entire thing was to suggest that black students, Latinx students, and then multilingual students were inherently, I don't know, incapable of participating in regular math class for some reason. Or were, or were automatically thought of by their teachers to be inherently deficient in learning ability. That was the that was the the, the proposal there. So maybe this is kind of the the genesis of what we saw. Uh, then we get on to bullet points. We developed a framework to assist teachers in creating culturally relevant, cognitively demanding mathematics tasks because we already know the teachers are already deficient in being able to do that. Uh, next, we extended the work of Mary Kay Stein, no idea who that is, and her colleagues on how to teach mathematics tasks that require reasoning and problem solving, along with the current literature on culturally relevant pedagogy. Uh -huh. And lastly, the framework provides guidance on how to think about culturally relevant teaching in practice. Okay. Mary Kay Stein and her colleagues helped us with that. Mm -hmm. And from that, we were able to come up with a framework that could assist teachers in making culturally relevant um, lessons. Because again, we have a implicit assumption that teachers are incapable of teaching math to anyone who isn't white. If I'm going to take the, are, are you going to bring up the the name of the book off to the side there? Because that seems awfully specific. And so this is one of the uh, tasks that teachers created. Obviously not. Okay, next slide. So you think you can draw. All right. Uh, she may go over this, but just in case she doesn't or only gives a cursory examination. Uh, bullet point number one. Your sister loves street art. Okay, you would like to recreate one of her favorite pieces for her birthday. You decide to create a poster board replica of this piece, even though you're not an artist. Suddenly, a deeper side of the image strikes you. Um, okay. Uh, next bullet point. This is going to be easy. You notice the tip of his nose. They're referring to a picture of uh, some uh, wall art to the side of a person's face. Uh, you notice the tip of his nose at 0, 0, the bottom lip at 0, minus 2. Where is his right eye? <clears throat> the bottom of his chin, the large patch of grass. The large patch of grass? Okay. What is the domain and range? Explain your reasoning. Try creating a replica on poster board. Uh, okay. Well, sure. If you're looking at that photograph, uh, since it is painted on a cinder block wall, you effectively have a graph of the art. And I remember doing this in art class. 
you would overlay a grid onto a picture and then you would replicate each square on the grid individually, tackling it in pieces rather than the whole thing at once. So, okay, that's one way to do it. But what does that have to do with, I don't know. I don't know. And I loved it. I thought of the students I used to teach right away because I thought of tagging and I thought of graffiti. What does this have to do with teaching mathematical principles? But one of the things that um, the teachers learned was that a task is not culturally relevant in itself. Okay, so so far our culturally relevant educational tools have been liquor stores, cornrows, and street art. Okay. It depends on the student. Uh -huh. So for me, this was culturally relevant for my students, but for another colleague, they didn't feel it was culturally relevant at all. Well, hey, here's a, here's a thought. Uh, why don't you take the culture out of it and just teach the math? Why don't you teach practical things that are relatively universal? Why do you have to put a quote unquote culture around it? If that's going to divide or somehow exclude people, why do it? And by the way, this particular task gets at domain and range. It gets at graphing on a coordinate plane. Again, you are cloaking political and ideological initiatives in mathematical teaching. This has nothing to do with math. You are using math to justify pushing a narrative. That's all you are doing. And honestly, it's not that innovative. Using math as a delivery mechanism to justify or to push a socio-political agenda, <laughs> it's been done before, it will be done again. Stop pretending that you're doing something amazing. You're not. You really, really are not. It gets at ratio and proportion and using a scale factor in order to reduce, sorry, reduce, <laughs> are or enlarge um, the picture. Why use street art? Why use street art? Why don't you have the students take a picture of something outside the classroom? Each one gets their own picture. You know, the kid gets to take a picture of whatever they want to take a picture of. And then you bring that picture back to the classroom and you put a grid over it and you teach it. Now, there's no cultural bias to it. The student has the agency to choose what they want to do as a subject. You can learn all that stuff. Why introduce quote-unquote culture into the, the lesson if the true goal is just to teach the fundamentals and the principles involved in the task? What? I don't have an educational degree. And I can think on my feet for things that achieve the same goal without adding a political or sociological sheen to it. So how do we move forward? I have no idea because it sure sounds like you want to stand still. So teachers trying to find uh, resources that would help them to create culturally relevant mathematics tasks. Uh -huh. They could look at uh, Bob Moses. He talks about math being a civil rights issue math being a civil rights issue i i really hope she expands on that i have a feeling she won't and what he talked about was oh, okay. how algebra has been a gatekeeper and how even in the co at the college level how some students have to take algebra two and three times in order to graduate college so it is I had to take algebra twice. Well, okay, I was threatened with taking algebra twice. Uh, just not that it matters, but okay. So I took algebra in my senior year of high school, and I had a really good teacher. I had a really, really good teacher. I mean, I, I'm an English major. I, I, I loathe having to do math. I can do it when I need to, but I don't, I don't have any particular uh, liking for it. But this teacher... Man, uh, one of the best teachers I ever had. There's like two teachers out of my high school years that really nailed it for me. Uh, one was anthropology and this other teacher was algebra. And I got 
and I'm not kidding. And he wasn't he wasn't screwing around. He wasn't lowballing anything else. It's math. I got an A plus in my math class, and that's for the entire that's for the entire year. And I hate math, but he was so good at teaching it. He made me really want to do it, man. And so I, I aced it. I mean, I really aced my algebra class. Okay, and then I go on to community college. In community college, you have some prerequisites and so on and so forth. And when I went to the you know counselor and they said, well, you need to have algebra. And I'm like, oh, but I, I got an A plus in algebra in my senior year. And I honestly cannot remember what their rationale was, but they told me, well, you have to have a uh, quantitative skills equivalent or, or requirement fulfilled in order to proceed. And algebra is one of those. And as soon as they said that, I was like, what's the other one of those? And the counselor was like, well, I mean, there's symbolic logic, but I was like, I'll take it. Because I didn't want to do algebra again, and they obviously weren't going to let me go any further without some quantitative skills requirement. So I took symbolic logic. Didn't regret it. Uh, so this has nothing to do with race. Some colleges and some things do not transfer over. But tell me more. It is indeed still a gatekeeper. Uh -huh. It keeps some students from really reaching their goals. And then some students. So some students have these requirements on them and some students do not. What delineates some students from the other some students? What are you talking about? It happened to me. Would it not have happened for someone else who also came to the uh, community college with the same things that I had? Thank you, Mr. Ticklechunk. We move forward sticking with human universals. Yeah. You know, underlining the commonality of us all and not trying to divide and delineate by quote unquote culture or the culture you decide is relevant for your students. We have other people like Gloria Latson Billings who talked about uh, teachers that were successful with African American students. I, yeah, I know. I, I'm, I'm getting specifically what you're talking about here. You're not talking about all students, you're not talking about any universals. So, yeah, this is if, if this is not uh, an early iteration of what we talked about on Sunday, uh, it's got all the hallmarks of being such. And then we talk about Peterson and Gutstein or Gutstein, excuse, excuse my pronunciation, uh -huh. who talk about math for social justice. And, and they have a lesson in their book called Buying a Home While Black or Brown. Uh-huh. I love it. Oh, I know. I bet you do. I really bet you do. It's it's mathematics with a political sheen on it. Or I should say, I take that back. I reversed it. It's social justice with a mathematics sheen on it. It's for high school students, and they get to read statistics about what is really happening when people go out and purchase, try to purchase a home. Depends on the neighborhood, right? Right. And then finally... I have a uh, math um, and culture and popular media. And I like that resource by um, Chappelle and um, Thompson, excuse me. This has nothing to do with math. Nothing to do with math. At no point in this entire talk has she talked about mathematics, except in the most general terms. She's talked about using it as a wrapping paper for political and social ideology. That's it. I like that resource because it brings in popular media. Uh -huh. So we can watch a clip from a movie mm -hmm. like uh, The Pursuit of Happiness, and she has lessons uh, to go uh, with that. The Pursuit of Happiness. That's an interesting choice. I wonder why that's on the curriculum. And so how will you move forward? I don't know. And, that, and this is what I say to you. Uh -huh. To move forward, this is what you want to do. Okay. You want to remember yes. what Craig Dotson says. Who? He says, in our classroom, we don't teach math. We teach children. <sighs> wow. Golly gee whiz, Batman. 
Just think about that. Oh, I'm thinking about it, and it makes absolutely no sense and doesn't mean anything. We teach children. We want to empower them. You want to indoctrinate them. We want them to be academically successful. You want them to be activists. We want them to be culturally competent. You want them to be good little drones. And so we think of all of these things. And there was one slide that I want to go back to. Uh, real quick, thank you, John Miller. Moving forward, don't teach math, teach dogma. Yeah. <sighs> okay, one more slide you want to go back to. Which one was this? Because I do have one more minute. And I just wanted to say that we also created a rubric to help teachers assess the level of cultural relevance. So for what? instance, in one of the characteristics of a culturally relevant uh, task, yeah. you have students will critique society. S okay, students critique society. Uh, are we talking about grade school students uh, using math to critique society? Uh-huh. Well, we don't do that very much in math, and, and, and it's actually okay that we don't. You're right. It is okay that you don't because that's not a math class subject. Critiquing society? That'd be a sociology class or maybe a political science class or something else. Okay, so you don't do that, right? But maybe we want to do it sometimes. Uh -huh. Or one of, the, one of the characteristics is that we use students' knowledge and, and knowledge of their community in math lessons. Okay, there's a line between associating math with real world examples, and then there's counting liquor stores. And so these are some of the tools that teachers can use to help them create culturally relevant math tasks, to use culturally relevant math tasks, and to engage students, give them an entry point into math, because as we know, math is cultural. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, there you have it, such as it is. Uh, a lot of things uh, that were echoes or perhaps precursors to what we talked about on Sunday, and which I'll be continuing to talk about this coming Sunday when I look a little bit deeper into the... Uh, uh, equitable mathematics program that's being pushed around. But anyway, on to the bingo card. Let me go over it once, see if we get anything new. And then after that, I will take any arguments or suggestions for squares to be circled. Collectivizes own demographic. Um, okay, again, I am assuming from what she said that she herself is a math teacher. Uh, so this is what teachers should do, we as teachers, and so on and so forth. So, yes, technically she did collectivize her own demographic. Uh, childhood or family anecdote? Nope, she never brought up her family. She never brought up her childhood. Uh, she brought up other children as far as her students, but no. Uh, diversity and inclusion. She never said the words. Um... And in fact, just about everything that she pushed had nothing to do with inclusion. It had to do with highlighting division. But maybe that's just my cynical take. I'll move on. Plays victim. She never played the victim. So can't really see that one. Microaggressions, unconscious bias. Um... Well, on the slide, there was that blurb talking about the deficit belief that uh, black students can't math, etc. So I'm going to circle that one. And she implied similar things over the course of her talk. Uh, privilege. I could see an argument somewhere in there, but I'll, I'll leave it and see if anybody in the chat has something to say. Contradicts own point or argument. Uh, yeah, she brings up the culturally different ways of expressing numbers and mathematics and then never goes back to it. Never goes back to it. Uh, she just, you know, drops that. And I understand that's kind of the weightless example thing, but either way, uh, her, her thesis statement had nothing to do with the rest of her talk. Absolutely nothing at all. 
Uh, patriarchy, no, she didn't bring up gender at all. Wage gap, no. Feminism, no. Marginalized marginalization, um, yeah. I mean, the whole, at least the initial basis of her talk was that you need to arrange your classrooms in order to uh, facilitate learning with, you know, the one kid in the class who's quote unquote culturally diverse or whatever. So technically, yes, I will uh, circle that one. Make sure I don't refresh the wrong page like last time and log myself out. White supremacy. <sighs> no, I mean, yeah, you could say, oh, the zip codes and the suburbs and things like that, but uh, I'll leave that one. Uh, self vilification or wretchedness. She never talked about herself in any disparaging tones. Um, the closest she got was saying how before her, I don't know, her grand awakening, she didn't think that, what was it, politics or whatever had any place in the classroom, and now she's seen the light. That's the best you could probably come up with, and I'm not sure that that's enough to call that vilification or wretchedness. She just changed her mind. So uh, attempt to coin new buzzword buzz phrase. <sighs> Was there any one thing she kept pushing? And also something that she wasn't pushing that wasn't just a reference of somebody else's work that existed before she got up on that stage? I can't really think of anything. I mean, there, there were a lot of buzzwords in there, but I don't think there was anything new. Uh, mind reading assumes motives. Yeah, I'm circling that one because teachers do this, teachers do that. Teachers believe students can or do, do this or that or whatever else. Um, so on and so forth. We have to do things specifically for black and brown students. Uh, benevolent condescension. Uh, yeah, that you need to come up with a very special curriculum using very, dare I say, stereotypical materials so that kids of a particular shade will become engaged and or understand because apparently they can't or won't unless you do, I guess. I'd be curious to know what examples or what exercises our uh, speaker would recommend for white students or Asian students to make them more engaged and involved. What, what things would she come up with then? An anecdote that probably never happened. Um, and my, my first and only really solid choice would be the one where the teacher went out and uh, had the kids count liquor stores. The fact that she said they did not succeed in their letter writing effort, but she didn't elaborate on how much they did succeed, tells me that that anecdote is probably true. They did go out, they did count liquor stores, they did send off that uh, city ordinance suggestion or something. Uh, but the fact that they didn't make it, I mean, that's at least honest, you know. Uh, she, she wouldn't have made that admission if it wasn't so. So I don't have any reason to think that that was a false anecdote. But uh, that being the case, this is where I'm at on the card, everyone. So if you have arguments for squares that should be circled, put them in the chat now. Be sure to tag my name in your comments so I can tell it apart from everything else. Uh, Dr. Key, new buzz phrase, cultural competence and relevance. I've heard cultural competency before. I've heard critical consciousness before. I've heard these terms before. These are not new terms. Uh, these are certainly not terms that our speaker came up with. So I can't call it news buzz phrase. Uh, plus the fact that even if, let's say that Let's say she has a new spin on either one of those phrases. She never gave us a definition. So if she had some new way of looking at those terms, she never offered it up. So I don't really feel comfortable calling those new buzzword buzz phrases. And here's the other, here's the flip side of the new buzzword buzz phrase. You would, you would effectively be giving credit to the speaker for coming up with whatever it is. And nothing in that said to me that our speaker came up with anything by herself. All this stuff is referencing other people's work. So, uh, Megan Ring, white supremacy by constantly implying that black or brown students need a different way of learning math, she automatically implied that she believes white students are superior, uh, or at least in the majority. Um, okay, all right, I, I'm, I'm willing to go a little bit 
uh, abstract on that one because at least as of right now, it's not going to lead to a bingo right off the bat. And yeah, that was there was an implication there of of that. So I'll, I'll give that to you. Uh, let's see, Mr. Tickle Trunk, Scribelet. I just want to say that I appreciate you and your channel. Well, thank you, Mr. Tickle Trunk. I appreciate you attending and uh, contributing and everything. Uh, I would not do these things if I didn't have people that wanted to watch. <laughs> uh, well, I might still do them just for my own edification, but uh, let's see, John Miller. So when are we going to get to the math part? That was a diatribe of social studies with side skirting and actual math processes. Yeah. Uh, notice that every time she brought up math, it had to be as an afterthought to the social and or cultural and or whatever example that was pushing a particular activist narrative or social uh, aesthetic you know, or cultural aesthetic. Uh, she didn't convince me, even as a layman, as far as a teacher is concerned, she did not convince me that any example she brought up to try to further mathematics understanding in students couldn't have been done with something else that was not either uh, culturally specific or politically specific counting liquor stores i mean that that one in individual that one that one example in particular uh belied any legitimacy anything came after that because why would you pick that particular thing if you were not trying to push a political agenda. Now, wh why couldn't you count trees? Why couldn't you count parks? I, I don't know. Something. Anyway. Uh, Mike, are whites being able to get loans for houses privilege? Oh. Oh. Hmm. Okay, now, that is implicative, hmm? or implicative, depending on how you want to say it. <sighs> okay, if you think the home loan example is enough, and I, I am putting, I'm putting this on you guys, if you think that is enough to constitute privilege, Put a one in the chat. If it doesn't pass muster on its own, or you have any doubt, put a two. So one for yes, two for no. And a two does not mean that, you know, it was a bad idea on Mike's part or anything. It's just, you know, we're getting down to this is a bingo. This is the keystone. I'll, I'll allow, I'll, I'll see what you guys have to say. Lexi says one, other choice says one, Cannibal Wizard says one, John Miller says one, 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 one. All right. I mean, you guys have been so good in the past of being so particularly honest when it comes to these things uh, and not just giving the easy answer for the sake of an easy answer. So uh, I, I, I was a little bit on the fence, but uh, I suppose in aggregate and in comparison to everything else uh, that she brought up in her talk, I guess, what do you know? Bingo. What? Of course! We have a bingo. Perhaps the only bingo of this episode. I'd be challenged to think there's another one in there somewhere, given all things. But uh, there's your bingo. Uh, I will give another couple of minutes if anybody else has any arguments for squares to be circled. Uh, you're going to have to. You're, you'll have a much, much steeper hill to climb for anything left over because, uh, as far as I can tell, like I said, new buzzword. No. Diversity and inclusion didn't even get close as far as those terms. And yeah, you could say, oh, well, you know, we have to come up with a way to, you know, make sure all students have a chance to access. And so, okay, I just convinced myself. <laughs> okay, diversity and inclusion, I will circle that one uh, because that that was effectively what she was uh, implying, if nothing else. Uh, let's see, that, that, don't refresh the wrong tab there, scribe. There you go. Uh, but uh, in counter to that, a, a new buzzword, buzz phrase, yeah, that's not happening. Childhood or family anecdote never happened. Patriarchy, she never brought up gender or gender roles or anything else. Uh, Mr. Tickleton, uh, diversity inclusion has to be those exact words. Uh, with most, most things on the bingo card, 
I am open to aggregate concepts equating to whatever it is in the square. Granted that it was, you know, close enough for horseshoes and hand grenades, so to speak, over the course of the entire talk. Uh, so uh, it, it is subjective. It does come down sometimes to, okay, if this is the last square before a bingo or a double bingo or something, the uh, the bar is much higher. Uh, but I, I, I will take... Uh, you know, overall themes or concepts over the course of a presentation, uh, if it makes sense. And since I just convinced myself there for the inclusion part, well, there you go. Uh, Mr. E, cultural relevancy is a new buzzword made at the time this piece of shit was put out. I'd never heard it before 2016. I doubt you did either. <sighs> See, that that's the problem, I guess. I can't turn my mind backwards to know whether or not this was the first time it was ever used. I have been exposed to that uh, phrase or things like it for so long now. Yeah. Maybe it was new at the time, and maybe that's one of the loopholes with that square. If I'm looking at older TEDx's, it's like, is it a new buzzword buzz phrase today? No. Was it then? I don't know. But again, again, one of the hallmarks of a new buzzword buzz phrase, and this goes back to uh, one of the earliest iterations of the card, is that you have a speaker who's trying to, th this was the inspiration for that that square, uh, white privilege, uh, oh, sorry, white fragility, uh, the Robin D'Angelo book. That catchphrase became her entire career, right? When I have a TEDx speaker that is using the platform as a sales pitch to push their own catchphrase, their own ownership over a concept, that's usually when that one applies. Or when someone says something I like to call, and then the thing. Given our speaker's tendency throughout this entire talk to be referencing other people and other people's work and other people's publications and so on, I have a hard time believing that even at that time, she came up with that concept. She was relaying things that she had seen elsewhere throughout the entire presentation. That is why I'm not circling buzzword buzz phrase because nothing there seemed to me as self-generated. It all seemed to be referential. So I, I understand where you're coming from, but she did not, she didn't give enough evidence to show that she was the innovator here. She was just the messenger if that makes sense. Uh, thank you, Mike R., for the Dog Cat Fox Bravo. Dog Cat Fox, you got a Bravo. Wowie, wow, wow. Dog Cat Fox is quite happy with that. Thank you, Mike R. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gay Rascal, I sent you a tweet about that TED Talk I mentioned with screenshots. Okay. Yeah, is it, if, if it's the one I'm thinking of, is this, is this one that I did way back in the day? Because it sounds very familiar. Dark Matter and, yeah. Okay, because that that lady that lady might have qualified for a WTF Hall of Fame at the time because it really was nonsense. Uh, let's see, Birgid, uh, scribe light anecdote that never happened for the cornrow story. Excuse me. It seems rather fishy that a teacher would single out a child like that. I may have heard the story wrong while doing some real math. See, I can believe that example because here's the thing. When she relayed the fact that the teacher wanted to ask a particular student because that student was black about cornrows, but instead tried to dilute uh, their own, let's say, I don't know, racial stereotype focus by emailing the whole class and asking, does anybody here know how to do cornrows? The, the, our, our speaker talked about that in sort of like happy, friendly tones, as though that were a good thing, ignoring the fact that the teacher started out with a racial assumption. It was not flattering to whoever this teacher was, but our speaker tried to sort of cloak it in something that was a good thing. Um and so all those things together, it was, it was such an awkward anecdote, just like the one where the kids sent this letter off, but they didn't quite succeed. There are elements there to make me think there's some truth to this. And I can believe it. And she mentioned that one of the uh, publications she was talking about used that uh, cornrows thing as an example. So nothing about it sounded false or self-aggrandizing. I guess that's that's one of the that's one of the elements of a anecdote that probably never happened. Is the anecdote 
overly self-aggrandizing? Is it too perfect? Is it then everybody clapped? That kind of thing. And I, I didn't pick that up in either of her examples. So, and just a couple more gay rascal. And that lady was a senior engineer at Boeing. First thing I thought of when that plane lost an engine a few days ago. Ah, okay. Well, when that, when that plane lost its engine pieces the other day, I was thinking of Donnie Darko, which I suppose in a way also involves dark matter, kind of, sort of. But anyway, everyone, I'm going to end it here. We have a bingo. It was a hard one bingo. And I appreciate everybody's argumentation for the other squares. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be a stickler. I'm going to be a stickler. Um, as far as relating to the subject of the equitable math education, it, this is interesting. Uh, this seems like it's got a whole bunch of concepts that we did see come up uh, in their uh, work materials on Sunday. And if you haven't seen that live stream, it's on my channel right now. Uh, it's got a big blackboard thing on it. It's about, you know, equitable math teaching or pathway to or thereabouts. Uh, Curriculum of Fear 31, I think it is. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, go check that out. Or just uh, look at the source materials you'll find in the description link on that video. Uh, just a programming note, on Sunday, this coming Sunday, I intend to do further examination of the equitable math uh, curriculum. Uh, I found, or I, should, I should say, a viewer whose comment disappeared. I, I was able to see the stub of the comment, but it disappeared after. I do not know if the viewer deleted it themselves. I didn't have a chance to get the name. I don't know if YouTube did that for some reason. Either way, they referred me to a Zoom interview with some of the founders of this equitable math program. Uh, and so I thought I'd start there uh, by getting, you know, sort of the high level explanation of what these things are and how it works. Uh, so I'll be doing that Sunday. I plan to do it at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. One caveat, the entire Zoom call is about an hour long. I don't know that I'll be able to get through the whole hour. I will do probably at least an hour's worth of live streaming. And hopefully through that, we'll get the, you know, the big concepts out of the way. Uh, so that's the only warning. I'm not going to do the whole deal. I My brain would melt. But there you go. So if you want to find out more about this along with me, look for me on this channel Sunday at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 11 a.m. Eastern time for the next installment of Curriculum of Fear. But... All that being said, everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you so much for your argumentation. Moder moderators, thank you for keeping an eye on things. Even though everyone is so well behaved, there's not really much for you guys to do. Everyone who donated, thank you so much for your generosity. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Uh, if you'd like to hear more from me or Satsu Two Cents, you can find the both of us tonight on my channel at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern for The Lords of the Night, where we will go over the news of the day, news stories you submit, what we've been up to on the internet, and then your questions and comments. Everyone, again, thank you so much for coming. I hope you are all safe and well. If you're not well, please get well soon, and I'll talk to you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.